Hello, greetings, lovely person, and happy Halloween. This is my Redux slash redo version of my walkthrough and review of the iconic D&D i6 Ravenloft module. I hope my voice will sound a lot better in this version when compared to my previous version. I am the Ancient. My beginnings are lost in the darkness of the past. I am not dead, nor am I alive. I am undead forever. Hello, and greetings to all you fans of RPGs and of Dungeons & Dragons. This is RPG Mods fan. and in this video I will be reviewing and discussing the legendary Dungeons & Dragons module I-6 Ravenloft, which was written by the husband and wife team of Tracy and Laura Hickman, and published by TSR in October of 1983. I confess, this is my favorite Dungeons & Dragons module. I admit, it has flaws. Despite its flaws, I still think it is the best D&D module Ever. This module was meant for player characters between the levels of 5 to 7. However, because of the way how I play the monsters and encounters more intelligently, I would recommend the player characters be at least 2 levels higher. Originally, this module was written for AD&D First Edition rules. The booklet of the module was 32 pages long. Ravenloft describes itself as a classic gothic horror story. Tracy Heckman says that he and his wife took particular inspiration from the original Bram Stoker Dracula text and the old classic films. Some of the films he is referring to are probably the old Hammer horror films from the UK. The Ravenloft module has received much love over the years. With the exception of 4th edition, it has received an update in every edition of D&D. Each edition added more to this original edition. By 2nd edition D&D, Ravenloft became its own campaign setting. In September of 1986, TSR published the I-10 Ravenloft II House on Griffin Hill module. It was brilliantly written and it can be run either as a prequel or as a sequel to the I-6 Ravenloft module. However, in my opinion, it was unable to capture that same magic that was I-6 Ravenloft. In August of 1993, TSR published the RM4 House of Strahd module. This module was 64 pages long and was meant for AD&D 2nd edition rules. By this time, Ravenloft became its own campaign setting, also known as the Realm of Terror, as well as the Domains of Dread. House Strahd is essentially the same as the I-6 Ravenloft module, but toughens up the monsters. For instance, Strahd is 6 levels higher in this edition. Instead of having gargoyles, this edition has margoyles, and other similar changes. In 1999, TSR published the Silver Anniversary issue of Ravenloft. This updated adventure was made for players between the levels of 11 to 13. Like the House of Strahd module, this adventure also toughens up Strahd, the monsters, and the encounters. In 2006, Wizards of the Coast published Expedition to Castle Ravenloft. 
which was written for D&D 3.5 edition rules. This book is 220 pages long. It mainly adds a number of non-player characters as well as encounters when compared to the original source material. The adventures in this book do not take place in the Realm of Terror campaign world. In Expedition to Castle Ravenloft, the Dungeon Masters are free to place the lands of Barovia wherever they wish. Ravenloft finally got its 5th edition D&D rules treatment when, in 2016, Wizards of the Coast published Curse of Strahd. This book includes the original adventure as well as expanded material. The lands of Barovia are from a forgotten world in the D&D multiverse, and this adventure gives glimpses into that world. In time, Cursed Barovia was torn from its homeworld by the Dark Powers and bound in mist as one of the Domains of Dread in the Shadowfell. However, do not let the 256 pages of the book fool you. It does not mean it added a lot to the original I-6 Ravenloft module. What it did was combine a lot of material that came before, including the previous versions that I just mentioned, as well as the Fair Barovia adventure that can be found in the October 2012 issue of Dungeon Magazine, issue number 207. The one thing I do not like about 5th edition D&D is that it got rid of level drain. In previous editions, the level draining abilities of many undead monsters, including vampires, made those monsters truly scary encounters. If I were to run Ravenloft for 5th edition rules, or Curse of Strahd for that matter, as a house rule, I would restore the level draining abilities of undead monsters. Likewise, I would restore the various restoration spells' abilities to restore such levels lost. As I mentioned before, Ravenloft was made into its own campaign world. In June of 1990, TSR published the Realm of Terror boxed set. Within this setting, in addition to vampires, all the other typical gothic horror tropes can be found, such as Frankenstein, the mummy, the island of Dr. Moreau, werewolves, etc. For dungeon masters who are interested in running this module, I would highly recommend also watching both Captain Courageous's and Seth Skorkowski's videos on the I-6 Ravenloft module. Both have some good ideas and tips on running this module. In the spoiler section of this video, I will use and mention some of their ideas and tips. I would also recommend viewing Maven of the Eventide's review of the I. Strahd book. Again, Due to spoilers, only Dungeon Masters should be watching these recommended videos. Maven of the Eventide has a lot more charisma than I do. So, I will let her describe the setting of the module. Vampires already existed in Dungeons & Dragons, of course, but the original Ravenloft module came about because players wanted to fight Dracula, specifically. I mean, who wouldn't? You take something you love, you add Dracula to it, instant improvement. Because unlike the high fantasy style vampires the game had before, Dracula comes with a certain aesthetic. A dark, spooky, gothic aesthetic. A creepy, haunted castle. Atop a cliff over a terrifying, wolf-ridden forest full of traps and nightmare creatures under the cover of a constant torrential thunderstorm. Hobwebs everywhere, creaking floors, echoing disembodied footfalls, 
eerie music from nowhere, flickering apparitions in the corner of your eye, mournful moaning down long, dark, drafty corridors. And of course, thousands and thousands of bats. So many bats! The Adventures of the Module takes place in the lands of Barovia. The lands that are reminiscent of Earth's Transylvania of the 17th and 18th centuries and all of its associated tropes and stereotypes. A region with soaring mountains, mist and fog-laden valleys, wolf-infested dark forests, wandering gypsies, and small villages populated by superstitious Slavic people. The people of Barovia are dour and live in fear. As I mentioned before, the I-6 Ravenloft module does not place the lands of Barovia in any particular campaign world. If the Dungeon Master were running the Realm of Terror campaign setting, then Barovia would be located off the center of the presented world map. If the DM wants to run this module in the fantasy world of Greyhawk, I would suggest placing Barovia within the environs of Jeff or Sturridge. If the DM wants to run this module in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, I would suggest placing Barovia within the environs of Damara or the Sunset Mountains or the Sunrise Mountains east of Thay. If the DM wants to run this module in the Mastara campaign setting, I would suggest placing Barovia within the northwestern mountainous border environs of Karamikos. The adventure starts as typical with the player characters are in a nameless tavern. A gypsy clothed in bright colors enters the tavern and delivers the displayed letter to them. This letter from the Burgomaster of Barovia is basically a plea for help and asks the player characters to travel to Barovia. Assuming the player characters do travel to Barovia, they then find themselves trapped in the domain by a ring of poisonous mist. There is a perpetual fog and mist throughout the lands of Barovia. This mist gets thicker when getting close to the borders of Barovia. This mist is deadly if the player characters try to leave the lands of Barovia. This magical fog slash mist cliche has been used before in a few other D&D modules. Damn, that was probably my longest introduction yet to a D&D module. Anyway, I will now be discussing the module itself, and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this module for their players, or are a player who already played through this module and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. The major locations of the module are as follows. The town of Barovia, including the tavern, the church, and the Burgomaster's mansion. Due to depopulation, Barovia is practically a village now. The gypsy camp, and, of course, Castle Ravenloft, which sits perched a thousand feet or 300 meters high above the ground and the valley of Barovia. The pillar of rock that the castle sits upon is known as the Pillar Stone of Ravenloft. 
The entire adventure centers around the vampire Count Strahd von Zorovich. The dungeon master should play Strahd the same way as players play their characters. Keep in mind that Strahd is highly intelligent and cunning, and should be played as such. Also, Strahd is no ordinary vampire. He is also a 10th level magic user and can cast some powerful spells. Strahd has motives and goals and will probably want something from the player characters, which I will discuss a little later. Hence, the Dungeon Master should not run the initial encounters with Strahd as lethal. Initially, Strahd will be cordial and courteous towards the player characters. Strahd's tragic tale can be read from his tome, also known as the Tome of Strahd. I will now let Maven of the Evening Tide summarize this tome. From the original Ravenloft module, what we already know is 500 years ago, Strahd was a decent guy as far as conquering warlords go, but he lamented losing his youth fighting wars. After he settled down to rule his countdom, he fell in love with a village girl, Tatiana, who was just so perfectly beautiful. But she was like, ew, you're old, you're like practically dead. And she fell in love with Strahd's hot younger brother, Sergi, instead. Sergi? Sergei? Sergei? Uh, even though there's a lot of oddly Russian names in this thing, I'm gonna go with Sergi because I had a friend named that in school. And it will piss off the pedants. Strahd already hated Sergi for being so young and hot, so he was like, Dead am I? I'll show you dead. And he turned to dark magic and made a bargain with death to stop aging and killed his brother on his wedding day, which turned Strahd into a vampire so he could have Tatiana for himself. But then she was like, ew, you're evil now. So she threw herself off a cliff and Strahd's castle and lands were transported to the bubble world. Tatiana keeps getting reincarnated and Strahd keeps trying to win her love, but she dies every time doomed to repeat his curse for eternity. While we're looking at the module, it also tells us that in Strahd's bedchamber closet are hanging 28 capes. Not one, not 12, not 20, but 28. Ah, ah, ah. The only three things I can add or clarify to Maven's synopsis are as follows. A. Strahd conquered the lands of Barovia and had his family, the Zarovich family, settle there. B. After killing his brother and after Tatiana flung herself off the walls of Ravenloft in grief and despair, the castle guards finally caught up to Strahd. Their volley of arrows were unable to kill him. Strahd was now a vampire. C. The body of Tatiana was never found, and the memory of her keeps haunting Strahd. Before dying of fright, Kolyan Indirovich was the former burgomaster of the village of Borovia. Due to the village's proximity to Castle Ravenloft, Indirovich had the unfortunate job of representing the community that most frequently faced Strahd's wrath. Kolyan raised both of his children to follow in his footsteps, his biological son Ismark and his adopted daughter Irina Kolyana. As the children grew up, Strahd began to take an interest in Irina Kolyana. The Indirovich family, and Iryana specifically, was invited to dine at Castle Ravenloft several times, but the burgomaster forbade his daughter from going for fear of the Dark Lord's intentions. Eventually, Strahd laid siege to his house with possessed beasts. The elderly burgomaster succumbed to the stress. Ever since, the burgomaster's death 
the possessed beasts have stopped sieging the house. These events were two weeks prior to the player character's arrival. The Barovian villagers are too afraid of the Burgomaster's house. Hence, the Burgomaster's corpse still remains in the study room. Adopted daughter of the deceased Burgomaster, Irina has been bitten twice by Strahd. Her encounters with Strahd are fuzzy memories, but she can recall clearly the blazing hunger in his eyes. Now, the villagers are afraid of her and avoid her. Irina is a sweet but troubled woman. Although she appears mild, she has a strong will. Irina does not remember her early past. She does not know how she came to Barovia, nor where she came from. Kolyan Indervich found her near the pillar stone of Ravenloft when she was but a girl. Kolyan adopted her and loved her dearly. Irina has no idea why Strahd is so interested in her. Although she does not know it, she is the reincarnation of Tatiana Fedorovna, which is the reason Strahd is so interested in her and wants her. Before she would do anything for the player characters, as a dungeon master, I would have her first insist that they help her get a proper funeral and burial for the Burgomaster. Effectively, both Strahd and Irina are the central characters to this module's story, and not the player characters. Hopefully, the Dungeon Master knows his or her players well enough to decide whether or not this is okay with them. If not, then have one of the female player characters be the reincarnation of Tatiana. In this case, Strahd will attempt to court this character. If there are no female player characters, then have one of the male player characters be the reincarnation of Sergi. In this case, Strahd will express disdain for the character and will later on attempt to kill him. Ismark Indirirovich is the son of the deceased Burgomaster and the stepbrother to Irina Kolyana. He frequents the Blood of the Vine Tavern. Ismark is aware that Strahd desires his stepsister, though he knows not why. He would love the player characters to help his sister and for their aid against Strahd. However, like his sister, before he would do anything for the player characters, as a dungeon master, I would have him first insist that they help him get a proper funeral and burial for the Burgomaster. Also, I would raise his level from second level to fourth or fifth, which makes more sense to me given everything that he and Irina have endured. Madame Eva is the leader of the Gypsies. Due to her fortune-telling abilities, she already knows the names of each of the player characters and some of their past deeds. She will offer to read the fortunes of the player characters, which I shall discuss a little later. To the player characters, Madame Eva is an old, crazy, and quite mad crone. However, that is just an act. In fact, she is quite cunning and sharp of mind. She serves Strahd as long as it benefits her and her troop. Strahd has given her potions that cancels the deadly effects of the fog. These potions allow the gypsies to travel in and out of the lands of Barovia. This is quite a lopsided economic system, because this means only the gypsies are able to bring in supplies into Barovia. Also, Madame Eva is a 10th level cleric. In the module, she already has the Raise Dead spell memorized. 
Given the high number of level training undead in this module, I would also have a restoration spell memorized. Fortunes of Ravenloft is an imitation ancient gypsy card reading. Fortunes of Ravenloft determines the goals of the Count himself and the locations of important treasure items. This card reading adds a great deal of flavor to the game, as well as some replayability. The Fortunes of Ravenloft is determined when the player characters meet with the Gypsy leader, Madame Eva, at the Gypsy camp and have their fortunes read. As prep work, the Dungeon Master should determine the Fortunes of Ravenloft ahead of time, just in case the player characters avoid having their fortunes read. As a Dungeon Master, I would want the player characters to meet with Madame Ava and have their fortunes read. To facilitate this, if need be, I would move the gypsy camp in the path of the player characters when they are journeying towards Castle Ravenloft. Also, as a DM, you need to determine if you want to stack the proverbial deck or let the cards fall where they may. I personally would let the cards fall where they may and substitute the new results for the predetermined ones. Wizards of the Coast now sells a Taroka card deck to determine the fortunes of Ravenloft. However, a regular 52 card deck of playing cards can be used. In this case, the DM should remove all two. 4, 6, 8, 9, and Joker cards from the deck, which converts it to a 32 card deck. The player characters are supposed to draw 5 cards from the deck. The first card is supposed to be drawn by a cleric in the party, which determines where the holy symbol of Ravenkind is located. The medallion adds plus two to the cleric's turn undead roll. When presented against vampires, it flares with the light of the sun for one to ten rounds. Vampires cannot move or attack while the medallion flares. The medallion can only be used once per week. The second card is supposed to be drawn by a magic user in the party and determines where the Tome of Strahd is located. The Tome of Strahd is an ancient work penned by Strahd himself. It is a tragic tale of how Strahd came to his fallen state. The third card is supposed to be drawn by a rogue in the party and determines where Strahd himself is located. The fourth card is supposed to be drawn by a fighter in the party and determines where the hilt of the Sun Sword is located. The Sun Sword is a magical sword. Long ago, its blade and hilt were separated. One of the swords that one of the player characters wield has the blade of the Sun Sword. If the blade and hilt of the Sun Sword were ever to reunite, it becomes a plus two weapon and a plus three sword against undead. Within 30 feet or nine meters of any undead, the sword will suddenly glow brilliant blue. Against vampires, the sword inflicts an additional 10 hit points of damage per hit. The fifth and final card can be drawn by any player character, preferably by someone who has not yet drawn a card. This card determines Strahd's objective and goal. The possible motives and goals Strahd has are as follows. Goal 1. Strahd seeks a new identity. Strahd will try to charm one of the player characters. If he is able to charm a player character, he will then try to be alone with the charmed person. 
Strahd then casts a Polymorph Other spell on the player character, turning the person into a vampire. After turning the person into a vampire, Strahd casts a Polymorph Self and turns into the likeness of the player character. He will then attempt to join the party, masquerading as the player character. Goal 2 Strahd wants to make a magical sphere of darkness. Strahd is trying to assemble a magical item that casts a continuous sphere of darkness. Such an item would greatly extend the range of his travels. Over the centuries, he gathered the pieces of the sphere one by one. Until now, he is missing only one piece, a black opal. To make this goal a possibility, as a dungeon master, I would have the player characters find the black opal in the adventure prior to the one leading up to this module's adventure. Goal 3. Strahd wants to win the love of Irina Koliana. Strahd will attempt to charm all the player characters and have them stage an attack against Irina. When they attack, Strahd will swoop down and save her from the player characters. Strahd hopes that the rescue will turn Irina's heart to him. Goal 4. Strahd wants the Sun Sword. Strahd wants to destroy the Sun Sword. He will confront the party and demand the sword that contains the Sun Sword Blade from the player character who is carrying it. Personally, I really like one of these goals above all the others. So, if the player characters do not draw the desired card, I would have Madame Eva draw a sixth card and state Strahd's secondary goal, which will always be the goal that I wanted. As determined by the fortunes of Ravenloft card reading, important treasure items such as the Holy Symbol of Ravenkind, the Tome of Strahd, and the Sunsword Hilt can be found in these possible locations within Castle Ravenloft. The Chapel of Ravenloft, which is on the ground floor of the castle. Dim Colored light filters through the broken and boarded up stained glass windows, illuminating this dust-laden ancient chapel. In addition to the possibility of the aforementioned treasures being found here, the icon of Ravenloft can also be found here. The icon of Ravenloft give good aligned clerics a plus four to turn undead rolls. It also can heal 6 to 21 hit points once per day. So, this module does give the player characters more than a fighting chance against Strahd. On the floor above the main floor, the Count's Audience Hall can be found. This immense room stands in chilly, brooding darkness. Thus thick cobwebs drape the room, hiding the ceiling from view. An aforementioned treasure item can be found in this room. Another room where an aforementioned treasure can be found is the study, which is on the floor labeled as the Rooms of Weeping. The walls are lined with bookshelves filled with ancient books and tomes. A huge fireplace hides the way to the false treasury room labeled as K-38 on the displayed map, as well as to the real treasure room labeled as K-41 on the map. Along with coins, the real treasure room may, in addition, contain an important treasure item, as determined from the Fortunes of Ravenloft card reading. Anyway, back to the study. On one of the walls, a huge painting in a heavy gilded frame hangs on one of the walls. 
The painting is an exact likeness of the Burgomaster's adopted daughter, Irina Kolyana. Though the painting is obviously centuries old, the likeness is unmistakable. By the way, the study lies next to the bedchamber. Before I move on to the remaining rooms that may contain important treasure items, I do want to point out a flaw in the castle's design. Aesthetically, I love the way Castle Ravenloft looks. It definitely invokes a gothic horror castle vibe. However, the castle has no bedchambers for a queen, children, and multiple guests. Actually, it does have one guest room, which I do not think is enough for a ruling family. Remember, this castle was built before Strahd became a vampire. This is the castle where the Zarevich family moved into. So, where are the bedchambers for each former member of the family? To me, this whole castle is one abnormally big bachelor pad. So here is my quick and dirty solution to this dilemma. Just duplicate the Rooms of Weeping floor once or twice above it and refunction many of the rooms as bedchambers for the Lady of the House, the Children, and Guests. They would all now be empty, of course, but that makes more sense than their complete absence. The DM can shorten the height of many floors to make these extra rooms fit. For instance, the main floor is 50 feet or 15 meters high. I do not think it needs to be more than 30 feet or 9 meters high. Another room where a Fortunes of Ravenloft treasure can be found is at the top of one of Castle Ravenloft's towers, known as the North Tower. Just below this room is the beating heart of the tower. The whole tower is alive and is known as the Guardian of Sorrow. There are ten halberds mounted on the tower walls along its spiral staircase. The Guardian uses the halberds to attack the player characters. The Crypt of Sergei von Zorovich is also a possible location where a Fortunes of Ravenloft treasure item can be found. Strahd's brother was laid to rest here. Strahd's own tomb and Crypt is also a possible location for an important treasure item. The smell of freshly turned earth permeates the air here. A shiny black coffin of finely waxed wood with brass fittings lies in the center of the crypt. If Strahd is reduced to zero hit points, his body will be in the coffin for the next eight hours. Within this crypt is where the bodies of Strahd's and Sergi's father and mother were laid to rest. Again, this is also a possible location for an important treasure item. Okay, let us go back to the lands of Barovia. After passing the main gates of Barovia, if the player characters were to search the nearby woods, they will find a dead messenger with the displayed letter. This is the Burgomaster's original letter. The one that the player characters have is a forgery meant to lure them into Barovia. The Burgomaster's original letter basically states that a vampire rules Barovia and that no one should ever enter it. In the center of the town of Barovia is Bildrath's Mercantile Store, where a number of overpriced items can be purchased. The owner deals with the gypsies for his supplies and inventory. Also in the center of the town of Barovia is the shoddy Blood of the Vine Tavern. 
Ismark Indredovich is likely to be encountered here. Also in the tavern are three disinterested gypsies. Given how important the fortunes of Ravenloft's card reading is, I would suggest to have one of the gypsies walk up to the player characters, offer a drink, and say that their leader, Madame Eva, wants to meet them. On the south side is the Burgomaster's mansion, where Irina Kolyana can be encountered. Borovia's church and cemetery lie on the north side. Priest Donovich is in charge of the church. He is a second-level clerk, which I find too low. At the same time, he cannot be made too high of a level, otherwise he would pose a threat to Strahd. Every night at midnight, a ghostly procession takes place. One hundred spirits rise from the graveyard and march the road to Castle Ravenloft. These are the spirits of previous adventurers who died trying to destroy Strahd. At the castle, the spirits march straight to the chapel, up the south tower's stairs, to the top of the tower, which is the highest point of the castle. There, they throw themselves down the shafts towards the Christ, where they disappear. If you are wondering, the interior of the tower's staircase would look something like this. While I am on the castle maps, let me just state, the castle itself as a whole is a dense dungeon, with plenty of creepy encounters, a few dangerous combats, and deadly traps, and with lots of ominous signs. The most dense portion of the castle is the catacombs level, which is the lowest level. There even is a deck of many things hidden somewhere in the castle. However, given how game-changing this magic item is, as a DM, I would replace it with another magic item. At location I is a driverless, horse-drawn carriage. If the player characters board, then the carriage will head off to Castle Ravenloft, where the Count has prepared an elaborate dinner for them. Personally, I would move the carriage to where the player characters are staying at and have it appear outside their door in the evening during dinner time. If the player characters arrived via the carriage, they then will hear organ music playing from the dining hall. They will see Strahd playing the organ. When he finishes playing, he then invites the player characters to sit down and dine. The Strahd that the player characters see is an illusion. As a DM, I suggest having the real Strahd here but with monsters nearby and out of sight, in case of trouble. In other words, this encounter should be a role-playing encounter and not a combat encounter. When the vampire Strahd Van Zorovich is destroyed, the adventure is considered over. However, if the player characters just want to flee Barovia, then, if they reduce Strahd to zero hit points and force him to flee to his coffin in order to regenerate, as a DM, you can have the Mist of Barovia lift temporarily, allowing the player characters to escape. It is also worth noting that even if Strahd were to achieve his goal, as determined by the fortunes of Ravenloft card reading, that does not necessarily result in the TPK of the player characters. In this case, Strahd can choose to let the party go and leave Barovia. Also, it leaves room for Strahd to remain in the campaign as a villain if he is not defeated.
The module's optional ending occurs when Irina Kolyana is accompanying the party and are at the castle's overlook. In this ending, Sergi appears. Irina realizes she is the reincarnation of Tatiana. Her and Sergi's spirits then reunite. The DM must decide whether or not his or her player characters are alright with not being the main characters in the Ravenloft story. If they are okay with this, then the DM, should he or she wish, can use this optional ending. Roll credits? Displayed are the credits found within the module itself. As closing remarks, I love this module. It is not perfect, but I think it is D&D's best module and adventure. It brought the trappings of gothic horror to Dungeons & Dragons. The villain was dynamic instead of being static and chained to one location or room. Due to how familiar the vampire tropes and cliches are, it is very easy for the player characters to picture the setting and environments in their heads. Actually, as prep work, I would recommend the Dungeon Master to watch some cheesy vampire movies, especially ones that take place in Transylvania, so that it will be easy to come up with descriptions quickly, as well as to make up some new NPCs on the fly when need be. Only one new monster makes its debut in this module, and it is the Strahd Zombie. Instead of creating normal zombies, the Count is able to make a tougher variant called the Strahd Zombies. In appearance, Strahd Zombies look like normal zombies, but have four hit dice instead of two, and for clerics, they are turned as mummies. The i6 module received great ratings on both Amazon's and DriveThruRPG's websites, averaging a 4.6 out of 5 stars between the both of them. There were many customer comments. I will only partially read two notable ones. This one reads, The original Ravenloft was hands down my favorite module back in the day. The Fortunes of Ravenloft mechanic was one of the most innovative things I had encountered in a D&D module to that point, and holds up really well to this day. The other thing that remains striking to me about the adventure to this day is how huge and epic the story feels while being confined to the old format of a mere 32-page adventure. It's well worth picking up both to understand why this adventure is such a classic, as well as to connect with the birth of one of D&D's most storied campaign settings, and most iconic villains. The other reads as follows. Ravenloft is great in so many ways. From the horror themes that inspired an entire setting to the dungeon design and the replayability of the module offers with a clever twist, this module is a masterwork. The themes are very similar to those in a Hammer Dracula film. A tragic villain that needs to be put down after his selfish ambitions justify his cruel and evil means. Wolves howl and chase the party, and a haunting castle filled with dread creatures that are slaves to their dark master. Even when the players aren't in his castle, Strahd will attack and torment them, and adding to the suspense of the game. Thank, Thank you for watching. watching. Hope, Hope this, this video, video has been informative, informative and entertaining. I have not decided yet, but in the near future, I plan on reviewing the other versions of Ravenloft, such as Expedition to Ravenloft and Curse of Strahd. 
Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. Just like the street lights lit this town Like a fire in a blaze, gotta burn it down Can't be afraid to leave this out We got this far, don't know how